So I'm going to scroll up just so you can see more of this. Um, by, you know, so this is kind of, it's a continuation, but it's literally like the continuation of some, you know, previous thoughts. So let me just back it up for a sec. Unit vector, we talked about that. We were coming up with a vector that pointed in the same direction, but had a magnitude of one. And um, and so that's what all this stuff was, you know, this work over here, right? So we have, you know, a minuscule vector in comparison to two, three, but it points in the same direction, right? Now we've been using the angular notation, you know, like the, uh, the component form with, with the angular brackets. We, we don't have to do that. We could use what we call a linear combination. That's the IJ uh, relationship. And that has to do with this. I'll take a look at that later. All right. Yeah, I'll take I'll take a look at the unit two stuff uh, related to that. It, it must be a setting that I just missed. All right. So I'll try to try to take care of that. Uh, so, but just continuing on with the vectors, we know that vector I is, and we only know this because I told you last time, but that that's the vector one zero, right? Vector J is zero one. And using these and scalar multiples, we could come up with any vector that exists in two dimensional space, right? So, and what, what I did here is I generalized it by saying x comma y, any any coordinate endpoint of a vector, x, y, could be thought of as x plus, uh, x comma y, uh, I can't even talk now, uh, x comma zero plus zero comma y, right? So, and just to reiterate that, that's the same as saying x plus zero comma zero plus y. All right, so that's the same thing. Now, if we factor out, all right, so factor out an X, and if we factor out a Y, we get this new sum, right? Basically, I'm dividing each term here by x. x divided by x is 1. 0 divided by x is still 0. Same idea with the y's. But in doing so, we can now refer to this 1, 0 as vector i and this 0, 1 as vector j. So we get xi plus yj. Right. That's a lot of uh, explanation for something that actually turns out to be fairly simple. The relationship between the component form and the linear combination form, or the sum of unit vectors. So I'm going to go back and forth just in terms of the terminology. This is also known as a linear combination. Right. The way we would represent negative 2, 4 is by slapping an I onto the x term, slapping a j onto the y term, and just adding the two results together, right? And you're like, okay, well, what's the value in doing that? Well, in terms of vector sums, uh, vector operations, it's a little bit easier when you work in ij form because it, it really adheres to all the algebra, that you know, algebra skills that you know. So the laws of algebra would apply. So by putting it as a linear combination, when I have to add two vectors, I'm adding really the coefficients of the i term, but it'll be in terms of i. All right, same thing with the j. It's, it's not the kind of thing that you necessarily believe. It, one seems just as easy as the other. Uh, it, it isn't until you're in a situation where you have to write a vector over and over and over again and combine terms and maybe even you know raise to powers and things like that. Uh, that you you start realizing, oh, you know, maybe there is something to this IJ stuff. And as of right now, it's just another technique. So for the second one, it would be zero I 
plus negative 9j, which I could just write as negative 9j. That's the other thing. A component form of a vector is always going to have the number of terms equivalent to the dimension. Right? So these are two dimensions, right? x and y, but you could have three dimensions, five dimensions, and so on. Right? So if the other components are zero, then you would have to put, like, let's say, for example, I have a vector zero, 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 one. All right. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, six dimensions. So this is in, you know, like we would say 3D for three dimensions. This would be six dimensions. So we would say 60. But you could also use the notation that I mentioned. Oh boy, when did I do that? A while ago. One of the first things I talked about. Actually, I don't know where I put it, but the idea of raising it's the equivalent to raising R to a power. Oh, here it is. All right. So R to the nth. So set of real numbers and the power represents the dimensions. And I mentioned when I talked about this, that that R was just, we write it that way when we type it, but it's really that double hatched R, right? That stands for all real numbers. And this would be in R6, all right? So that's six dimensions. All right, so... I could write my vector like this, or if we have the different components that make up the vector, we're talking about I, J, K, right? We would continue on going down the alphabet for every, for every dimension, every dimension be accounted for starting with I. So this would be the ith term, the jth, kth, lth, mth, and nth. So this would be zero i plus zero j plus zero k plus zero l plus zero m plus one n. So in linear combination form, it would just be n. So we could write instead of saying all of this, we could just trim it on down to this, all right? And again, LC is for linear combination, all right? So that, that's, I mean, very trivial example because, I mean, it's like, well, what is, you know, what's the sixth dimension even look like? I mean, we haven't even talked about what the third dimension looks like. You know, you have a sense of it because in, in the real world, you got length, width, and height everywhere. So you can kind of, uh, you know, rationalize it in your mind. But the the concepts, they translate from one dimension to another. So that's what I was saying, oh, probably two classes ago, where you learn everything you can about the second dimension because everything that applies for the second dimension would apply for the third dimension. The only thing is, it, well, so two dimensions so two dimensional system is if you're in three dimensions if you're if you're talking about coordinates in a three dimensional system the two dimensional stuff accounts for the first two variables in your three dimensions you would only have to uh figure out what what would be happening with the with the third dimension you know so it's basically like the coordinate axes from a top down perspective all right. So that that's that's how we look at the third dimension. All right. Uh, I, I could show you let me show you an app in a little bit that that takes care of some of this stuff. I'm debating whether I want to do it now. Eh, I'll do it later. All right. Now number three, <coughs> vector u is a unit vector, so magnitude of one that forms an angle of sixty degrees with a positive x-axis. Use standard unit vectors. To describe you, all right? So I'm just going to draw a quick sketch. 
we have a vector that's length is one and it forms a 60 degree angle with the positive x axis. All right. And we want to know what that vector would be. Uh, we could start off with component form and then just go from there. Okay, because in the component form, vector u would be r cosine of whatever theta is, comma r sine theta, where r stands for the radius. I forget what notation, I'll come back to this in a sec. I forget what notation I used. All right, so yeah, I used the magnitude notation. I'll do it that way for consistency. So that one, so we're calling this vector u, magnitude of u is equal to one. <laughs> this is actually a good tie into polar coordinates because the conversions for x and y into polar coordinates is r cosine theta, r sine theta. As it turns out, the, the magnitude is going to, in most cases, be the radius of some circle, right? Now you kind of look at this and say, well, I don't see a circle here. Anytime you draw a line segment, you can create a corresponding circle associated with that line segment, where that line segment is the radius of the circle, All right? So this is actually the radius of a circle. So you would be equal to one cosine 60 degrees, one sine of 60 degrees. Cosine of 60 is equal to one half. Sine of 60 is radical three over two. It's all unit circle stuff. But if I want it in standard unit vectors or linear combination form, I would just slap an I onto the first term and a J onto the second one or the components. Oh, I already did the I. All right, and so that would be, well, I'm representing the vector in multiple forms. So that would be I, either, either one of them would represent the vector. I'm just trying to clean up the diagram. I'll just put it on the outside over here, maybe. All right. So what we can get out of this is that U is equal to magnitude of U cosine theta I plus magnitude of U sine theta J. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just tickling my throat. It just won't go away. All right. So you could kind of jump right to it using that. Now, the whole idea, it, before too long, you want to get to a point where you're not actually writing all that out. You just know it. But, um, but you know, it takes a little to get it used to because it's not stuff that you've really done much with before, if anything. <laughs> but this is going to set us up nicely for applications of vectors, right? So uh, solving word problems. I mentioned back in the beginning of the unit that, or at least when we transitioned to the vector stuff, that we would be able to use vector sums, vector operations, to um, to solve law and, law and cosine, the law of sine and cosine problems, all right? So first example, example, example is the first word of the day. So example, as in we're gonna do a few examples of this concept applications of vectors. Example, the first word of the day. Right. So 
A jet is flying at a velocity of 500 miles per hour due north when it encounters a wind blowing out to the west at 50 miles per hour. Draw a diagram and use it to find the jet's resultant velocity to the nearest town. So we're expecting decimals, otherwise it wouldn't tell us to round to the nearest town. I'm gonna draw a diagram first. There is um, often <clears throat> a disconnect between what we do in a classroom and what happens in the real, in the real world. Uh, this is the easterly direction, north, westerly direction, and south. But we think of the easterly direction as zero degrees. The northern direction is 90 degrees, 180, 270 and 360. All right. The reason I'm mentioning this is because if you're actually working with a compass, uh, due north is actually the zero degree mark. All right. So it changes a little bit of the orientation, but it's still manageable. It's just you sort of have to recalibrate when you're going from one to the other. So the jet is flying at a velocity of 500 miles per hour due north. So I'm going to draw that in there. Here's my jet going due north. Um, we want to name our vectors. So I'll call this vector N. And then we have one that's going out to the west at 50 miles per hour. So I'm going to make that a little, little shorter. It doesn't have to be a perfect proportional relationship in terms of the diagram, but it should be at least in the neighborhood, I guess. I can't get it to lock in, so this is aggravating. Let me do it this way. So this vector I'm gonna call lowercase w, All right? <clears throat> we have the angles. They told us the angles indirectly. They said north, due north and west, All right? So, the magnitude, I'll just make a note of this off on the side, the magnitude of N is 500, and the magnitude of W is 50. Now, what we want is the resultant vector. I want to get a sense of not only the uh, the magnitude of it, but also the direction. I want the direction. They're not asking us for a direction, but I do want my diagram to have somewhat accurately depict the, the direction. So I'm going to use my tail to tip method. And I'm going to take N, vector N, and replicate it over here. It'll create a new point, which I'm going to connect. You know, let me change the color on this. That endpoint gets connected with the origin to create the resultant vector. All right. So this vector here is n plus w. All right. So that's what we need to figure out. To do that, I'm going to state vector n, and then I'll state vector w. <clears throat> now vector n has I'll, I'll use um i'll use the ij notation because we just covered it so i might as well just put it to use all right so it's magnitude multiplied by the cosine of the angle that gives you the i term all right, we have the angle indirectly. We have the angle for N based off of the zero degree angle. This new angle is 90 degrees in a counterclockwise direction, which is why we, we call it 90 degrees. So the magnitude, you know, I'll, I'll just write the formula first. Magnitude of N cosine theta 
magnitude of n sine theta. So it's going to be 500 cosine 90 degrees pi plus 500 sine of 90 degrees j. Now you can run it through a calculator. Because when in direction say that you're um, you're going to round to the nearest tenth, then the expectation is that, that you're going to have decimals, and therefore you would be using a calculator. Uh, that being said, if you happen to know that the cosine of ninety degrees is equal to zero, and that saves you at least some typing, so zero i, the sine of ninety degrees is one. One times five hundred is five hundred. So 500J, so this whole thing simplifies down to just N is equal to 500J. Now I wanna do all that again, but with a W. Right. <clears throat> so W is gonna be equal to the magnitude of w, w cosine theta I plus the magnitude of W sine of theta j. Now in this case, theta, well that, that w is pointing in the direction of 180 degrees. All right, so we have the magnitude of 50, so 50 cosine 180 degrees i plus 50 sine of 180 degrees and that's going to be J. All right. Cosine of 180 is negative 1. So this is going to be equal to negative 50. Oops. I wanted to make that an equal sign first. Negative 50 I plus sine of 180 is 0. So plus 0 J. And so we end up with W being equal to negative 50 I. <clears throat> All right. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, couldn't I just use the Pythagorean theorem to figure this out? If this, if this one's 50 and this one's 500, couldn't I just do that? Yes, but they're not always going to be right angles. So that's why I'm taking you through something that we, we know we could do a different way. All right. So now what I need is the vector sum. The vector sum would be n plus w. So negative 50 i plus 500 j. So I'm just taking these two pieces, this one here. I'm putting it at the end because it's the j component. And the negative 50 I'm putting here because that's the i component, even though it says n plus w, and I put the w first and then the n. It, it would have simplified to this anyway because of the commutative property. All right. So now if I want the magnitude of n plus w, the magnitude formula when it was in component form was to square each part, add them together, and then take the square root. It's the same deal. All right. Because remember, this is the same as negative 50 comma 500. All right, so I'm going to do negative 50 squared plus 500 squared all under a radical. Pop it into the old calculator. And we get 502.49, it's the nearest tenth, so 902 point, uh, 502.9, uh, 0.5, sorry. Uh, that would be miles per hour. Those are the units because <clears throat> the vectors, the, the vectors had magnitudes that were in miles per hour, right? So when you add the two vectors and come up with the magnitude of the resultant, it should have the same units 
must have the same units as the individual components. Okay. So what this is saying, you know, physically, I think it kind of makes some sense. Uh, although you may not necessarily realize it, because you know, if you don't think about these sorts of things, but when you have wind blowing, you know, it's not always going to be in your face or at your back. You know, like when you're walking down the street and you feel the wind at your back, you don't have to put in as much effort, you know, assuming it's a fairly strong and strong wind. You don't have to put in as much effort to walk forwards. But if you turn around, now the wind is in your face, it's pushing against you. And it happens in sports all the time. You know, the wind is blowing in one direction in a football game. So, you know, like when the team's going into the wind, maybe they would run the ball more and the team team is going with the wind, then they would throw the ball more because they know that they're not fighting against the wind. And uh, so stuff like that. But this is really getting at what happens if the wind is not directly in your face or directly at your back. It can still aid you, right? It's just not as you know obvious that, that would be the case right because a wind going to the west is i mean is it going to make you go slower or make you go faster right and so this is showing that it would actually make you go slightly faster right now the issue that you run into is that yeah you're going slightly faster but you're not going in the correct direction anymore all right so that's another thing that we would have to address let me uh, actually talk about that now because it does come up fairly frequently. And, uh, you know, there's no time like the present. I'm just going to slide this stuff over a little bit and create a little extra space. All right. So the angle, we can figure out the, again, the question didn't ask for that, but no time like the present. To figure out the angle of the movement, uh, it's kind of a two-step process. The first is to actually figure out what the reference angle is in here. So we'll call that theta, All right? So I'm gonna use, because the information that I know going into the problem would be the opposite side and the adjacent. One of them was 50 and the other was 500, All right? So what we do is we figure out the tangent ratio, opposite over adjacent, All right? And what we're actually using is just the magnitudes, All right? So we're looking at the magnitude of well, n, vector n. <clears throat> In this case, tangent theta is gonna be the magnitude of n over the magnitude of W, all right? The opposite side over the adjacent side, all right? So if it, if it happens that they're nice numbers, then that's great, but it doesn't always play out that way. What I'm gonna do is apply, I'm gonna plug in the numbers and then I'm gonna apply the inverse tangent, all right? So the numbers here again, we have tangent theta is equal to 500, over 50. All right. We're not concerned with negatives in terms of the ratio because that, that's for the direction. <laughs> and that has that has meaning. But to keep it as simple as possible, if we work with positive numbers, what it's going to do is it's going to return an acute angle. Or I mean maybe a right angle, depending on you know, like whether or not that's actually the case, but it's something between zero and 90, typically, uh, definitely, I mean, all right. So I'm going to do the inverse tangent. Theta is equal to the arc tangent of 500 over 50. I mean, if you just want to put 10, that's fine. I'm going to put the ratio though. I'm in degree mode in my calculator. It, it's fine either way. It's just, it, it's going to relate to the units that you put your answer as right so it's nice that you know we do pretty much everything else in this part of the unit in degree so it's nice to keep it that way all right so shift 10 put in the 500 over 50 and we get 84 and change 
I'll say 289. All right. But I need the angle off of uh, east, uh, off of zero degrees. So they gave me, or we figured out this angle, but what I need is this angle. All right. So I need to know what that is. <laughs> Since there's 180 degrees in a half turn. So if we went all the way from here to here, we would cover 180 degrees. So we're going all but whatever that angle is, 89 degrees and, so, uh, and change or whatever it was. So if I just do a quick 180, minus, oh, 84 degrees, 180 minus 84 and change. So 180 minus the previous answer, I'll get 95.7 degrees. Right. So that would be the angle of the vector, uh, specifically the resultant. And in terms of the uh, language, nomenclature, whatever, uh, we we tend to use resultant and resulting sort of interchangeably. Right. So one one is officially the name of the the resulting vector is called the resultant. Right, but I suppose they're all resulting of something. Yeah, so that's that. And right, so the angle of the resultant, and it's off of zero degrees. Right, zero degrees being defined as the easterly direction. Now, if I wanted to know what it is off of due north, which could be a, a, a follow-up question, essentially, how far off course did it go? I might want to know this angle. In which case, I would just do 90 minus that previous answer. So I'd be about 5.7 degrees off course. Okay, so you can kind of look at it that way too. Now that's, you know, it's, it's a problem that you could have done uh, using a variety of different methods having nothing to do with vectors. So I wanted to take you through an example or two that were a little juicier, right? So number two, for a man to cross a, a lake to a point directly east of his cabin, he must set a course six degrees south of due east so as to compensate for a current that flows to the northeast 30, 30 degrees north of due east. Man's boat travels 20 miles an hour in still water. What's the rate of the current to the nearest integer? And what's the resultant vo velocity? of the boat. All right, so let me draw a diagram. We have a lake. All right, I'm gonna call this the lake. We have the, the person starting over here, right? And here's where his cab, uh, directly east of his cabin, so we want to go, so here's his cabin. This would be directly east. So we're looking at this being zero degrees. It's the easterly direction, All right? Now, I'll get north in there also, north and south. Let's move this. I get that stuff in there. Now he's going to set a course six degrees south of due east, right? Because there's a current going north. Oh, you know what? Sorry. Th this diagram is not the worst, but it's not the best either. Let me do something. Let me do it a little bit uh, in a more convenient way. Because we could define the origin as the dead center of the lake, but we don't have any information about that. So I'm going to define the origin as his starting point. All right? It's just a slight adjustment, but it, it goes a long way in terms of keeping it um, reasonably organized. Apologies. 
And I'm just going to let me go. All right. So it was going six degrees south of due east. So we got some kind of propulsion taking them in this direction to compensate for a current that's flowing to the northeast. Right. So something in this direction. I'm not going to make it as long as as I made this one because the current, I mean, it shouldn't really be that powerful. So you got to figure it's going to be, uh, I mean, if there's a current that's going to 20 miles an hour, then that's, that's something, All right? So I'm going to call this one vector N and this one vector S. It really doesn't matter what you call them. I just try to call it something that's somewhat in the neighborhood of what we're, what we're asked to find. You know, so north of east versus south of east, right? Now, when they say this is the thing that tends to confuse people, if the man's boat travels 20 miles an hour in still water, right? So that what that means is that if there were no current, 20 miles an hour, like the intent to travel at 20 miles an hour would be the same as the reality of traveling 20 miles an hour. It's kind of like... Um, you know, when you're on a flat road and you put enough pressure on the gas pedal when you're driving to go 50 miles an hour and you and you have an idea of what that is, how, how hard you have to press down on the gas. But then you come across a hill and you press on the gas with the same amount of pressure. You're not going to go 50 miles an hour. Right? Your, your speed is going to be reduced. Right. So what's happening here is. He's aiming six degrees south of due east and running his boat at 20 miles an hour, right? So the, the idea there is that 20 miles an hour is going to end up being some other velocity once we factor in the, uh, the current, right? So the magnitude of S is 20 and the angle you could look at the angle as one of two possibilities. You can you can name it as a negative angle, negative six degrees, or you could go around the other way. All right. If you go around the other way, actually, this looks weird. The little arrow was kind of looking funky. All right. So negative six degrees, or we could say 354 degrees. Either way is going to work out. All right. Now, this other angle here is 30 degrees. The current is unknown. We have no idea what the magnitude of the current is. All right. And I think, yeah, so we have the angle. We have, we have both angles. We have the velocity, so the magnitude of vector S, but we don't know anything else. All right, so we want to know what the rate of the current is going to be so that we they're telling us to find the magnitude of N. And then also, um, well, once we know that, then the resultant velocity of the boat. All right, but if we figure out the first thing, the second thing comes along pretty easily. All right, so N is going to be, I'll do this in component form. Magnitude of N, cosine of 30 degrees magnitude of n sine of 30 degrees for the s magnitude of s oh actually sorry we we know that one so 20 cosine negative 6 degrees 20 sine of negative 6 degrees <clears throat> All right. So the vector sum should end up being him going to his, his destination. All right. So this is one where the actual path that he's following is the resultant vector, or it's intended that it's the result vector. So I'm going to do a tail to tip here. Okay. 
it never really ends up the way I want it to. I'm just going to move the point. All right, so you got to edit my... The, the diagram isn't really that important uh, in terms of solving the problem. It's just, it's, it's a little bit more satisfying when it ends up being, you know, an accurate depiction, I guess. So let me just clean this up. And also, we we know this from throughout the course. I'm kind of particular about like weird things, things that don't always matter, and that ends up being the thing that I care about. I don't I don't know why it's probably a personality flaw. All right. So that vector sum should be equal to, and I'll use the highlighter here this all right now we do have a direction on that we just don't really know anything else all right so i know that n plus s should be equal to well I don't, whatever the magnitude is all right so i'm going to put in magnitude of n plus s cosine of zero degrees magnitude of n plus s sine of zero degrees. All right. Now, at first glance, it kind of seems like, well, do we have enough information? But we do. And but only and I'll tell you this only because something nice happens when you're on the axes, when you're on the coordinate axes, sines and cosines are friendly numbers, zero, one, negative one, all right? So what I can do, I'll use a yellow highlighter here for those keeping score at home. I'm gonna take my first vector or the component of my first vector, first component of first vector, magnitude n cosine 30 plus 20 cosine negative six degrees, that's gonna be equal to the magnitude of N plus S cosine of zero degrees. And at, again, like I said, at first glance, it's like, okay, this, I got two variables here. I got this one and this one, but cosine of zero is equal to a one. So at least the angle goes away, all right? And now we have a relationship where if I can only figure out what the magnitude of N is, then I'll be able to get my final answer. So I'll do the same thing with the other components and something even nicer happens. All right, so I'll take that and put it off. Uh, I don't know where to put it. I can do this. I'm just gonna kind of chuck it off on the side. So this is all, I'm trying to color code it in a reasonable way. This is all the result of yellow, the, 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 um, the first component. The second component, magnitude of N sine 30 plus 20 sine negative six degrees equals magnitude of n plus s sine of zero degrees all right so that's all the result of setting up an equation involving my second components and the reason i know to add and set them equal is because i have n here s here what happens if i add n and s the result is i get n plus s all right, so that's my, my blueprint. Now, sine of 30 is one half, so this becomes one half magnitude of N plus this disgusting sine of negative six degrees. But then the really nice thing happens, sine of zero is equal to zero. So the whole right-hand side zeroes out. All right, so then I can subtract 20 sine 
negative six degrees from both sides. Unless you wanna work with hideous decimals every step of the way, rather than just saving a hideous decimal for the end, uh, I recommend that you use this notation. So I have one half magnitude of N is equal to negative 20 sine of negative six degrees. And if I want magnitude of N alone, I just multiply both sides by two. So the magnitude of N is whatever I get when I pop 40 sine of negative six degrees into my calculator, All right? Calculator's in degree mode. So negative 40 sine of negative six result the current has a magnitude of four point they said rate of the current to the nearest integer so uh four miles per hour now they they also ask what's the resultant velocity of the boat All right so for that i can just take my answer here and plug it into the other equation All right so i now know the magnitude of n now, to represent my final answer, I wrote four miles per hour, but it's not really four miles per hour. It's really 40 sine of six miles per hour or 4.18113853. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this notation. I'm going to use uh let's go to the gray here. This is what's going to get popped in for n. So negative 40 sine of negative six degrees, cosine of 30 degrees, plus 20 cosine of negative six degrees. All of that is equal to the resultant, resultant, I was just making sure, because if it said resultant vector, I would have to put it in component form, but they want the velocity, so they want the magnitude. So negative 40 sine negative six cosine 30 plus 20 cosine negative six close it up and hit enter and we get the magnitude of the resultant to be 23 point, they didn't say a uh, rounding instruction. I mean, I suppose we could assume the same rounding instructions, but I'm just gonna write 23.5 miles per hour. All right, so that's the resultant velocity. All right, so, what this is saying is that the current is actually aiding in his uh, in his movement, which is kind of interesting because it says uh, for a man across boat, he must set a course six degrees south of due east to compensate for a current. So to compensate normally means to like overcome or to balance out, but in the in the positive direction. Here, what he's his compensation is going the other way. He's going to he's going to go slower. He's going to produce less power from the motor because he knows he's got the current to help him. All right. So, you know, sometimes it's it's a matter of like, okay, if it's working against you, your resultant velocity is let's say 15 miles an hour, but you want it to be 20 miles per hour, that means you got to put more juice into it. Uh and and so this is this is the opposite of that. He's basically saying that all right, if I go anything, if I want to go 23 and a half miles per hour, I don't know why you specifically would want to go that speed, but then I would have to produce whatever power is necessary to go 20, 20 miles per hour. That's what I was talking about before, where if you're driving in your car, you push your foot on the gas, you kind of got a feel of what 50 miles an hour feels like, and then you go up a hill you're going to have to you're going to have to compensate you're because right? you're going to be slowing down if you still want to go at that same speed then you're going to have to press down more on the gas same idea works the other way when you're coming down a hill if you want to go 20 miles an hour 
50 miles, whatever it is, that it, it might be the case that you take your foot completely off the gas, right? Because gravity is uh, doing a lot of the work for you, right? So uh, gravity and momentum, right? So it's not a physics class, but, you know, th these are some physics concepts that, uh, that you know, I, I would believe everybody can relate to. Now, I don't own a boat, so I don't know about that. But, I mean, the car analogies should make sense. I mean, even if you take the bus, you know, like, it's just the noise level in the bus when the bus is driving uphill versus downhill because they got to put more gas or diesel or whatever it is to get the bus to, to go up. And so you hear that engine working. Right? So, you know, like, it's, it's something that everybody can kind of uh, relate to. Um, and, and even if you don't take the bus or drive, maybe you ride a bike. Requires more power to pedal uphill, right? Same thing in, in reverse going down the hill, right? Maybe you just take your foot right off the pedal or, you know, just let it cycle itself, right? So these are all different applications. Uh, number three, same, same theme of, uh, you know, velocities. Tabitha took a journey in a blimp due north, traveled at 45 miles per hour by setting a course 17 degrees west of due north to compensate for a wind that's blowing 50 degrees east of due north. All right, so it's the same kind of problem, just going in different directions. Uh, we want to find the actual velocity of the wind-blown blimp to the nearest integer as it traveled due north. All right, so... Again, a little north, south, east, west diagram. East, north, west, south. That's my zero degrees. You don't have to label all the way around, but I do recommend that you label zero degrees because of the point of reference, uh, direction of reference. Uh, 17 degrees west of due north. All right, and she's going 45 miles an hour. So we're going to assume that we'll just kind of call this 17 degrees west of due north. That means that this little angle in here is 17 degrees, which means the real angle is 90 plus 17, so 107 degrees. All right. So we were given, typically, we're given angles with respect to some cardinal direction, north, south, whatever. But what we want it is, or what we want is the angle relative to zero degrees, All right? Now the other one, let me just, I never put my labels in the right place at, at first, so. Nope, that's not gonna work. i just kind of tuck that over there. The second vector, it's 50 degrees east of due north. So now it's the wind. So again, it's not going to be, if it's a 45 mile an hour wind, you know, like maybe you shouldn't be up in the air like that. That's where that goes. So I'm going to make it a shorter vector. And that one is 50 degrees. Oh, sorry. 50 degrees east of due north. So this angle here is 50 degrees, but I want the one that's relative to the easterly direction. So that's 40 degrees, All right? So the two angles that we care about are the 107 and the 40. Now we wanna find the actual velocity of the blimp to the nearest integer as it goes into due north. Uh, and, and the magnitude, so I, I'll call this one, you know, staying with the idea of calling it uh, N or W or something related to the direction. This one is west of due north, so I'll call it vector W. Magnitude of W is 45. All right, this one we'll call E for the easterly direction. Uh, lowercase, really, is the way to go. Uh, and the magnitude of E is unknown. And right? so it's very similar to what we just did. So I want to find the resultant, well, I know the resultant vector, right? The resultant vector is the y-axis, even though my diagrams will never bear that out. It's kind of frustrating. So I'll do a tail to tip and I'll, I'll adjust my picture because it's just how it is. 
So it should be something like this. The bottom line is I drew one of my vectors too long. So I just kind of live with the consequences. Uh, but it is still the same, same numerical values. It's just the idea here is that because the resultant is going to be the instance where you're going due north, that the two vectors, the tails and the tips, should end up meeting back at that resultant vector. All right. So this one here is just the sum of W and E. All right. So this is vector E plus W. And we're looking for the magnitude of E plus W. All right. And this is an instance, unlike the previous one where uh, the previous one, yeah, uh, I didn't really care about the angle. Uh, actually, two problems ago. I don't really care about the angle because I already know it. They said where the resultant's going, that it's going due north. So I already know the angle is 90 degrees, which can be helpful, right? Keeping that kind of stuff in mind. All right. So, I'm going to diagram out vector W. Oops, I want to go black there. W is equal to, I'll go back to IJ form here. So magnitude of W, cosine, theta, I, plus magnitude of W, sine, theta, J. All right. Now we have we have lots of information about W. All right. We know the angle and we know the magnitude. So we actually know the vector. All right. So that's good. So 45 cosine 107 degrees I plus 45 sine 107 degrees J. Degree, degree is our second word of the day, as in 107 degrees. Degree could also represent the highest power in a polynomial. It could represent a temperature, perhaps in Fahrenheit. Degree, the second word of the day. All right. So we can figure out all this stuff, but again, we, these aren't special angles. So 107 degrees, if I put that cosine of 107 in the calculator, it ain't going to be pretty, all right? So I'm going to leave it as is for now, all right? And move on to E, which has uh, less information known about it. So E is the magnitude of E, which we don't know. Cosine 40 degrees, I. Magnitude of E. Sine of 40 degrees, J. All right, so I have one linear combination where I know lots of stuff, and I have one where I, I, I'm missing some information. All right, so then- I have a question. Yeah. I know you highlighted in green, but can you just recap why it's not cosine of 50 and it's cosine of 40 instead? Because what we want is the angle coming off of zero. So when they said 50 degrees east of due north, they gave me this angle. Uh -huh. But I want the one coming. It's always got to be relative to zero degrees. Okay. So I would need the angle going the other way. All right. Thank you. No problem. All right. So we, we do know a little something about the red. E plus W is equal to, we don't know its magnitude, right? and that's what we're looking for, but we do know the angle. So we'll leave it in terms of E and W, but again, if you're on an axis, good things are going to happen numerically. Cosine of 90 is equal to zero. All right. So this is really saying zero I 
plus sine of 90 is equal to one. So plus E plus W is a magnitude J. So I'll set up my two equations. One will be easier to work with. All right, the one that involves a zero is definitely going to be the easier, easier one to work with. So you may consider starting there. So I'm going to take this, add it to this. Oh, sorry. Add it to this and set it equal to this. All right, so that's going to be 45 cosine 107 degrees I plus magnitude of E cosine of 40 also I is equal to zero or zero I if you want, but zero is fine, All right? We have like terms. Those I's are like terms. So we can put these two expressions together. So this is the same as saying 45 cosine of 107, 107, that, that wasn't even close to a 107, 107 degrees plus cos uh, E, sorry, magnitude of E, cosine of 40 degrees, I is equal to zero. And, and really, if you leave the I attached to the zero, I'll put it back in, it becomes a little clearer that what we're looking for is instances where this is equal to zero because we have the common I on both sides. You know, so for some people, they, they tend to stay away from the IJ notation when they, when they have complicated expressions because it can get a little mind bendy, but it's all, it's all based and rooted in um, algebra that you're all familiar with. All right, there's no, no surprises here. So I'm gonna say 45 cosine 107 plus magnitude of E cosine of 40 is equal to zero, which is honestly what you would have got if you used the component form. So, you know, just be strategic about how you do this. All right, I wanna get the magnitude of E alone. So I'm gonna subtract off from the left-hand side. I'll just talk you through this part of it. I'm gonna subtract off this. So that's going to give me a negative 45 cosine of 107. Okay, so I'm subtracting this from both sides, zero minus that. And then I'm going to divide by the cosine of 40. It's kind of a mental step where you're saying, all right, if I subtract 45 cosine 107 from both sides, what would I get? I would get negative cosine 107. But then on the left, I'm left with E cosine 40, how do I get the E alone? Divide by the cosine of 40. All right. So negative 45 cosine 107. Oops, too many. Divided by cosine of 40. So the magnitude of E is going to be they said nearest integer, draw a diagram, use, find the actual velocity. Well, this isn't the actual velocity. It's about 17.2 miles per hour. We need the other one. We need the E plus W, right? So we have part of the answer. It's just not the entire answer. And it's not, it's not like you could just say, well, I'll add that to the 45 and, and get my, it doesn't work that way. They're not, they're not pulling in the same direction. So I'll set up my second equation, which is this plus this is equal to this. So 45 sine 107 degrees J plus magnitude of E sine 40 degrees J. You know, I really don't need these parentheses. makes it a little bit messier than it needs to be. And that's going to be equal to the magnitude of E plus WJ. Right. So there's a spacing issue here. I'll bring it back in in a sec. 
something lost a hat here. Oh, yeah, part of the five. All right, so this is going to be equal to the magnitude of E plus W J. All right. And again, we could just kind of disregard the J's because they're not going to matter anyway. We got J's distributed everywhere. So, and, and if you want to, even if you are using IJ notation, you can, you can skip putting the J's here if you know they're just going to cancel out anyway. Uh, magnitude of E is this lovely expression right here. So that would go in for E here. So negative 45 cosine 107 over cosine of 40. And then multiply by the sine of 40 that's already there. A little uh, savvy move here would be if you recognize we have a sine over a cosine. You could make that a tangent just so you have less stuff to type in, but it's calculator work, so it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, so 45 sine of 107 plus this, bring that right back into the conversation, times the sine of 40 Pop all that in, and you get a simplified form, which is good. Sometimes you need that. You know, it justifies what I said about the tangents, but in this case, it's not really overly meaningful. But what I can do is I can scroll across, and I get the magnitude of E plus W. Oh, sorry, I don't need the J. The magnitude of E plus W is about 54 miles per hour. All right, so this individual was traveling, producing enough power to travel 45 miles per hour, but it ended up going 54 miles per hour based off of uh, contributions from the wind. All right, so it's another case like the. Uh, like the what you call it the uh the boat and i you know like i don't know too many people i don't know anybody who flies a blimp but i got to imagine anything that involves aircraft you have flight plans you have uh timetables things like that you know like if you're going like you're going you're on a flight somewhere and you're going 500 miles per hour and the, you have the wind at your back, like you're going to get there earlier than you would if there was no wind. Okay? So that's why when you're, when you're traveling out to the West Coast, whatever the stated time is, is, is it's, the, it's the stated time. It's, like, it's going to take five hours to get there. It's going to take about five hours to get there. But on the way back, they say, oh, we got the wind at our back. They say, you know, like we're in the jet stream. Uh, it's going to shave about half an hour off the trip. Right, because it's not as predictable. It's 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 predictable, but it's not down to the nearest second predictable. Right, so it, you see what the wind is like that day, and and you end up uh, maybe saving some time on the on the back end of the trip. You know, so and personally, that's the way I like it. Because yeah, it may take a, lo a little longer to get there, but when it's time to go home, I just want to get home. You know, so. Um, yeah. Time do we have? The next problem I, I I forgot. This one this one's actually a little too complicated. Uh and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying for you necessarily. Um, I'm saying it's too complicated based off of what I have been teaching you. It, it involves a little bit more physics. So we're gonna just skip number four um and just kind of toss that one. All right. And so just wanted to take a couple minutes, maybe like five minutes, and talk about polar coordinates. All right. So 
and and we will get to a point where the vector vectors and polar coordinates come back in into play with one another so uh you'll see the relationships but i just want to talk about the structure of the polar coordinate system and also how to plot points in a polar coordinate system all right so that's uh page 10. so this this is our polar coordinates version of the xy axis all right you'll notice some familiar angles all right there's there's more than uh, than you're used to but we do have the 30 45 60 90 all those special unit circle angles all right all the way around the circle and in fact this ring here that actually is the unit circle all right so that that first ring out from the origin that's actually the unit circle and everything else is a scalar multiple of the unit circle based off of the radius all right so the way we plot points in a coordinate in a polar coordinate system is based off of the radius and the angle from zero degrees All right, so zero degrees, zero radians, however you want to say it. All right. What we do is identify the given angle or identify the angle, and then either take steps toward or away from that angle starting at the origin, which we call in the polar coordinate system, we call the pole. All right. So if you look at this as the top view going down from, you know, like from space, top view of the uh, North Pole that point in the middle would be the north pole itself all the circles would be latitudes and all the lines would be longitudes all right so if you're familiar with the the globe in that sense that that could actually help uh with understanding all right uh degrees radians doesn't matter it all depends on the context but uh but yeah so essentially find the angle and if r is positive you take steps towards the angle if R is negative, you take steps away from the angle. All right, so I'll plot a few points for you here. So the first one is telling me to take three steps toward 60 degrees. So I would find 60 degrees. I'm starting at the pole. All right, so you're starting here and you're gonna take one, two, three steps towards 60 degrees, that would be point P. All right. The second one is one step away from seven pi over six. So I'm gonna find seven pi over six right here. Now, there's a, an imaginary line segment that extends from 7 pi over 6 to its opposite counterpart. All right, I'm going to make that a dashed line because it doesn't really exist. All right. These are our two possible pathways when we're plotting a point and the angle, the, the angle of interest is 7 pi over 6. Anything spanning from 7 pi over 6 to pi over 6. Pi over 6 would be the opposite direction of 7 pi over 6. So for this one, I'm standing at the pole. I'm looking at the 7 pi over 6. So my, my, my perspective is this way. I'm just going to take one step backwards. All right. So one step backwards is going to put me there. And that would be Q. All right. So it's always a matter of identifying the angle the location of the angle and whether or not you're moving towards it right it could be towards could be against uh, away all right now for r we have a negative angle but it's still the same relationship it's two steps toward negative two pi over three the only difference here is i have to find negative two pi over three all right so 
two pi is the number of radians in one turn around the circle. So if I want if I want the positive code terminal, I would just add two pi to this. So negative two pi over three, add to it two pi. Now, if it gives you something clean, which it does, four pi over three, then, then you're good. So now I'm just gonna find four pi over three. And most of the time that's what happens, All right? So I'm now gonna find four pi over three, just label that on the graph, which is right here. And I'm gonna take two steps towards it. So that's gonna put me right here. So that's point R. And then the last one is two steps away from, all right, so this is two steps away from negative 135. All right, so I would identify the location of 135 degrees. Oh, sorry, apologies, negative 135. So I need the positive coterminal. So to find that, I would take my negative 135 because it's degrees, so there's 360 degrees in a circle just add 360 to it and I get 225 degrees. All right, so 225 degrees, let me get my highlighter. 225 is right here. We're taking two steps away from that. So again, this is another instance where we have that imaginary line. All right, this represents the possible pathways when plotting a point. I just like to make it dashed. So I'm standing at the pole, I'm facing the 225. I'm gonna take two steps away from it, which means I'm going in the direction of 45. And that's where my S would be. Okay, it's a different way of plotting points, but you do have your, only two components, uh, the radius and the angle. So there's only so many ways, like if you were to try to like make up this process, like if I didn't give you any instruction and I told you to plot three comma 60 degrees, I, I'd like to think it wouldn't take too long before you just figured out, okay, well, they gave me the angle. So it must be something to do with that angle. And we have rings that look like they're evenly spaced. So maybe that three represents the number of rings that I'm going out. And that's really exactly what it is. All right. Um, scaling is still a thing, you know, we, we scale with coordinate, uh, coordinates in the X, Y plane, but you could also scale with polar. Like I could let one ring equal five units, 10 units, a hundred units. It doesn't matter. All right. And in fact, if we think of every ring as a latitude on the planet earth, then you're looking at rings that are spaced by hundreds, thousands of miles. I'm not really sure. I should probably look into that. Right. So just something to think about, because next class, we're going to learn how to convert back and forth between rectangular and polar coordinates. So X, Y coordinates and R theta coordinates. And then we'll learn how to make some graphs. All right. So uh, not just plotting points, but graphing equations. All right. And the, the NumWorks calculator uh, does handle this very well. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the little uh, little tips, tricks of the trade when it comes to that, too. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording.